you are live. We are live uh, on my Facebook page. Uh, thank you uh, for joining us. Thank you to Kate and Rachel for joining me tonight and bringing your wine along. Cheers, ladies. Cheers. Thanks for having us. Happy Wednesday. <laughs> it's nice to be able to say this in person because we haven't been able to uh, do it all year. Um, so, yeah, I'm glad that we can all convene here um, yeah. remotely and catch up with you. Um, so tell me, uh, how is your how is your Wednesday been, Kate? What's the what's the, the a Wednesday day in the life of a writer? Well, at the moment, I've got three jobs on. So I'm writing my second book in my um, two books for Viper. So the first one was um, A Ruined Girl, this one, which came out in, come on, Kate, when did it come out? Just now. Uh, end of August, end of August, yes. Um, and um, and I'm also ghostwriting a memoir, which is um, really eye-opening and uh, really interesting work. Um, and I've just finished a, a short story as well for an anthology that I think we'll be talking about um, a little bit later. So I've just been tweaking that this morning. Wow. Yeah. What about you, Rachel? What does your day involve? So I've got various writery tasks on at the moment. Um, I am writing number four in the series I write for Head of Zeus, which is um, DCI Martin Janssen, who solves all the kind of murky crimes that happen. That's the one. Oh, yeah, this is the current one out. Um, he solves all the murky crimes in the apparently oh so nice middle class world of St Albans. But actually, when you scratch the surface, there are some pretty, pretty kind of terrible things happening. Um, so number four is out next year. And number three, um, I had a chat with my editor. The edits are coming back for that next week. So I'm kind of currently working on three and four. But I actually this morning had a filling just to kind of break up the day. <laughs> I was one of those lockdown people who lost a filling and then had to wait forever to kind of get it put, put back in. Yeah. Um, so it's all back in and I can feel my face again because I couldn't at about lunchtime. I wasn't sure I'd be able to speak. So yeah, <laughs> we're back, back. <laughs> I thought, did, you, did you manage to carry on writing this afternoon? I was actually, when we, we all agreed earlier that we would have a glass of wine tonight mm -hmm. and then that kind of got me thinking like maybe maybe I should do more writing on the wine. Like, does that work? With, I mean, obviously in the past that has worked mm -hmm. splendidly for some writers, famously. <laughs> Do you think that would work? I mean, after, when you had your Novocaine this afternoon, Rachel, could you do it? Or does that, you know, do you have to be clear headed? So I sat in front of a film that I could have a little weep in front of. I watched Crazy Rich Asians actually this morning, which is kind of happy, 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 funny, funny, little cry at the happy ending, um, because that was all I could really face doing. And then after lunch, I managed a thousand words. So I definitely needed the kind of the numbness to recede. But I do find if I'm writing at night with a candle burning that a kind of glass of wine sometimes helps um, just kind of with the mood. I think you've got to be in the mood sometimes for some scenes, don't you? Well, yeah. you wonder if, you know, a little bit of that sort of, you know, lubrication might kind of get the subconscious going. I mean, does that, would it work like that for you, Kate? No, I, <laughs> I I tried it. Um, yeah, like when back in the day when I would try and write in the evenings, I I tried to write in the evenings for years, and it literally just does not work for me. Um, I don't know why. I think, uh, I don't know. I I don't know why it is. I think I'm just sort of processing everything from the whole day or something like that. And um, it would have been perfect, you know, especially pre children, you know, when I was working like when I was working full time and stuff, doing other jobs to be able to do that in the evening. But it just never quite happened, and I gave myself so much of a hard time for not being able to do it. Um, but recently, like in the last kind of year and a half or so, I've really forced myself into becoming a morning person. Right. So I get up super early and I, you know, I try and get my my work, well, some of my work done um, before the kids are up. Yeah. But my daughter's just started secondary school, so she's at a different school now. So we all have to get up earlier. So it's kind of gone a bit wrong again. But um, yeah, I should probably try it again the evenings. But yeah, no, drinking and, and writing does not work for me. I really wish it was. But then I wish I was heading away in lots of ways. And I'm just not. It's just um, not. No. I had to during lockdown because I had two kids to homeschool. So my kind of child day started at eight. So I would get up at six. I would work till eight. And then once I'd done bedtime, 
then I would do a couple of hours again in the evening and I couldn't have written anything I think if I hadn't done it sometimes mm. it just needs must just yeah isn't it to fit it all in sometimes yeah, yeah I always find that I can do editing late in the day like that's yes. fine yes. if I'm writing the first draft I can't write that in the evening I'm too yeah. sort of just I don't know just brain frazzled really yeah. I feel like it really does need like my my best creative brain to create yeah. new stuff but yeah. editing yeah I can I can edit like I can sort of like mold the clay but I can't kind of mm. produce the original yeah yeah right yeah but like you said Rachel I mean during lockdown I sort of for a little bit because I was, I was working on a first draft at one point it's now mm. finished and it's sort of I'll put it aside for a little bit but um I I got into that little habit of getting up quite early and doing sort of two or three hours and 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 it was brilliant actually it worked so well and I was thinking god you know maybe this is like the work maybe this is the thing and I need to carry on but of course exactly as you said I can't do that now because the kids are back at school yeah. and I have to be taking part of I'd have to get up at sort of five o'clock in the morning to get kind of two hours before they get up at seven mm. and then you know that's it's not really sustainable is it I could probably do it for a couple of months if I had to kind of blitz something if I was one of those writers where you just I'm going to write this first draft in six weeks or something, mm. you know, works for some people brilliantly. But I don't think I'm one of those people. I think I need to write over a slightly longer period. And then and so then I can't just kind of exhaust myself. Mm. No, it's true. And, and like you said about the two hours, I think like I personally, I can't write in like little snatches of time. I, I really do need to be able to have like you know at least an hour and a half two hours for me to even like if I have if I know that I've got that space that time ahead of me I can do it then but yeah if I've got like 20 minutes you know a lot of people just like oh just flip open the laptop type away for 20 minutes and then you know they've got 500 words done and like I would love to be able to yeah. do that um, but it's, it's the kind of faffing in and out of it isn't it that, that yeah. that's why that doesn't work yeah, yeah. Mm. what was really working for me with the early mornings was when I was a bit organized and like the, the day before at some point during the day I would write some kind of little note of what I was going to write mm. at least where I was going to start the next day mm. as the, I would get up in the morning at like six or something and and not even like I literally just sort of got out of bed I didn't make a cup of tea I didn't get dressed I just got out of bed picked up the laptop sat in the nearest sort of convenient comfortable spot and just started because as soon as I did anything mm. the, the sort of the faffing starts whereas if I could just literally like you say open the laptop and just be like almost like I'm halfway through a sentence like oh mm. I'll finish that sentence and then off you go you just yeah. it's like someone giving you a big shove in the back and you just start moving you know mm. I've heard Claire McIntosh actually say that she never finishes uh, writing unless she's halfway through a scene because yeah. starting at the beginning of something is always the hardest thing to do so she ends where she can start right in the middle the next day which I don't do that is great that advice what you're saying Joe would make a lot of sense actually mm. yeah. yeah I mean I remember reading that tip about the half a sentence thing like mm. even end halfway through a paragraph or even halfway through a sentence so that the next morning you get up and you kind of think right I know how this sentence fin finishes and as soon as you start typing it's like you're you're going you're you're in the flow mm. and then just breaks that kind of thing we should see we should say hello to a few people because i don't know whether you both of you can see all of the comments but uh kieran is here hello kieran okay. He's from the tamworth book club who i was oh, actually okay. talking to earlier today uh kerry is here harriet tice is here and claire empson so thank you to hello you guys all for dropping in uh, kieran's actually come straight in with a question for you which kind of relates a little bit to what we were just saying do you have any writing quirks to get the creative juices flowing Hmm. I've, 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 I've um I've discovered listening to like really loud music recently. <laughs> like, I think it's partly because my kids are back at school and everything's really quiet. So wow. I've um, yeah, I'm I'm sort of experimenting with new genres of music. So does that explain yeah. your trance music that you were listening yeah. to? Yeah. Well? Today was trance day, <laughs> which <laughs> was like I, I didn't see that coming, but it was awesome. Um and um anything without without lyrics like I could well without English lyrics so yeah. I can listen to sort of like Japanese hip-hop or whatever but as long as it's not in, in in a language I understand or a language that I can even understand enough to try to understand because if like I speak like a terrible small amount of like you know secondary school Spanish and and French and so if it's anything like that I'll, I'll be like typing away and I'll be like hmm, what are they actually saying so um not that but yeah some some loud music um a lot of coffee um I don't really I feel like I'm still very much learning about 
process, even though I've been doing this for, you know, a long time. Um, and like you were saying, Rachel, like, you know, about starting halfway through a scene, like that's, I'm going to do that tomorrow. That's going to be my new thing, you know, and let's see how that goes. Do you find the music kind of affects your mood though? I mean, does it almost like start to creep into the writing? Because I kind of, I, yeah. I worry that if I'm listening, to, obviously, you know, it's a bit of an obvious example, but if you're listening to something really upbeat and you're trying to write something that's quite sort of all tense and, you know, uh, quiet, then it, it, mm. it's going to kind of, it affects your BPM, doesn't it? Like it gets your heart rate going. Too. Yeah, I think this is why I've started listening to, you know, I, I can't listen to anything. Yeah, like classical music, like, slow classical music would just not work for me at all it has to be I think it's almost I'd love to see like have a brain scan and see what's actually happening but I think really what's happening is that it's it's loud enough to drown out any kind of other background like a white noise yeah it is um, and that's why it does have to be without lyrics but it's like it's enough to sort of stop me sort of my my mind drifting off I've got mm. like I've got that going on like blasting me with that and then I've also got you know the writing there's there's no space for anything else mm. that's what i think is happening so um, i listen to um one song over and over so i'm writing mm. the fourth one at the moment is set in a cathedral and there's a kind of murder in the cathedral and it's kind of dark and there are candles and i did this actually with the first one as well i had a midnight mass scene and i listened to abide with me kind of almost on repeat for about two hours just to give me that kind of kind of really intense kind of you know that cathedral kind of haunting feel there's a couple of um Catherine Jen Ken Jenkins songs as well there's another one um so like some kind of it it's a film I can't remember at all what it's called I think it's Lord Father of Mankind but it's again it's that really kind of haunting hymn like kind of cathedral feel but two hours two solid hours of the one song my husband who's working at home at the moment thinks I'm going insane yeah. but, um, <laughs> If it like exactly like you say, if I'm listening to the lyrics, I can't do it at all. So the fact that it's on repeat and I kind of tune it out so quickly, but I've got that kind of ethereal feel mm. kind of around me and it really helps. It will probably change how you'll ever kind of hear that song now that you've written this manuscript yeah. for that song. Like it's always going to be sort of overwritten, if you like, with this, you know, whatever. I mean, it's a crime novel, so I'm assuming it's dark. Oh, wow. um, you know uh, it, it's going to be sort of overwritten with it isn't it there was mm. one when I was writing my first novel there was a there was a particular song that I used I couldn't listen to it when I was actually writing because like you say it had lyrics um but I would listen to it almost to kind of like get me into the mood and it started to become like a sort of Pavlov's dogs thing where I would listen to it and I would just kind of do kind of almost kind of drop into the right sort of vibe mm. for the book and, and, and get into it but now I can't you know if I hear that song it just takes me back to those days of sitting there you know and it was the first novel where you were working on it and no idea if anything was ever going to come of it you know so that mm -hmm. sort of anxiety that you had um but yeah that song now sort of holds all of that it's been written and then the other way around so I find this really interesting so with audio but sorry it's changing the subject slightly but like so you, you know when you listen to music and you sort of associate certain writing with that I find that if you listen to audiobooks but you're somewhere particular when you're mm. listening to that audiobook, then that, you know, either thinking of that audiobook will always make you think of that place, or being in that place will always make you think of that book. Yeah. And so I have a particularly weird thing with you, Rachel, where when I was listening to um Under the Ice, right? I was um I listened to the audiobook while I was doing, and it was at the beginning of lockdown, and I was doing a whole load of shifts making PPE, like volunteering oh, making PPE okay. in this oh. in this school in Bath. Um and so now I have this association with PPE and your book. <laughs> you know, obviously you see PPE everywhere, but I still kind of associate it with that. It's really brilliant. Really <laughs> nice. I find it generally. I've actually I've been sort of trying to get myself into audiobooks, and I'm really struggling with it. And I I kind I think I'm just too distracted because I, I find it really hard to just sit there and listen. To an audio book. And I know that's kind of the point of them, like you can do them while you're doing something else. But I do find that I just sort of tune in and out. And is I think they're too slow, though. So again, I, is it because they're really slow? Because I speed mine up like super fast. I, I, I do. I listen to them when I'm doing exercise. So when I was kind of running during lockdown, and I'm not much of a runner, to be honest, 
So I was, I kind of found, I found that listening to the books as I was going was so much easier than listening to music because I mm. wanted to know what happened next. Whereas with songs, you know, I love, everyone loves exercising to songs, but you know them, you know, it's yeah. not such a big deal. And I think partly because I was homeschooling as well, it was a bit of a treat to be out of the house and listening to a book. So the longer I ran for, the more kind of, kind of treat reading time that I got. So actually mm. that was really helpful. Yeah, I've been I've really got into recently um, sort of some radio dramas, mm. so previously Radio 4 stuff and a couple of sort of podcast things. And some of them are quite, you know, they're quite wacky. Mm. Those, yeah. They're almost like short stories, I suppose, and yeah. they can go off in like really quite strange directions and they can mm. sort of sustain a kind of um, like a high concept, mm. probably more than you could in a novel. And I'm quite mm. enjoying it. There's a whole bunch of stuff that I've just recently did. I'm very late to the party, I'm sure, but I've just discovered it on kind of BBC Sounds, and I'm really into that. Mm -hmm. Sort of when I'm, yeah, mm -hmm. driving or or, or running. Um, yeah. So, oh, we should also say hello to uh, Heather Critchlow has Hi, joined, Heather. Um, and Kerry says she listens to Audible at the gym and while she's eating. Ah. I could actually do that, and then I could sort of. Sh I'm, I'm not. I'm not going to say what I was just about to say about our family uh, arguments over the family dinners. I'm going to edit myself at that point, and <laughs> in another direction. I'm going to stop that thought. So, Kate, I was going to ask you about your novel, which has just come out, A mm -hmm. Room Girl. This draws on your experience working as a, a, an undercover investigator. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that work that you did and how it kind of fed into the novel. Sure. So um, what I used to, so I, I started doing this, um, I started doing it myself when I was working on Watchdog. Um, and we would do like little investigations where, you know, you'd have a tiny little team and you'd be making basically a five minute film or whatever. And um, and there were a few there were a few investigations where not everybody would want to do the undercover work, right? And I'm always just like, that sounds like fun, doesn't it? We did this one particular thing about witch doctors. So there were these <laughs> it's bonkers. Um, but there, you know, people would leave like um little cards in like post boxes saying, you know, um, you know, are you you're trying to get rid of your husband or whatever, like come and see us and we can kind of curse them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and everyone else in the team was like, No way am I getting involved. And I'm like, it's made up, like that's not a real thing. <laughs> And so I'd go in and you kind of, you have a little, I probably shouldn't give away the trade secrets, but you have a little pinhole camera, like tiny, tiny little pinhole camera and it's concealed in your clothes. And, um, and you know, you just go along the film. Um, you have to have a certain level of evidence in order to be able to do it in the first place. So you can't just literally just turn up and, you know, feel like filming somebody. Well, you can, but you can't broadcast it. Right. Um, uh, so anyway, yeah, it sort of became my, my specialism. Um, I think I'd blend in quite well. I think that's probably why I was good at it because um, I, I do a lot of listening and I'm, I kind of, I think I'm sort of a bit of a, yeah, I just, I, I sort of, I can dilute quite easily. Um, so for this one, I did, um, the, the stuff that informed A Ruined Girl was when I was working on this investigation into children's homes. And um, there aren't as many children's homes now as actually there used to be. It's, um, it's sort of in many areas of the country, it's been sort of wound down a bit, but, um, yeah, I, I, I worked in various children's homes around the country for this um, documentary that we were doing for Dispatches on Channel 4. And um, and there was this there was this one boy who um, I haven't I, he's, he's always been in the back of my head, like since I met him, because he was he was a teenager and he acted so tough, you know, really, really tough like nothing could upset him and stuff but he was he was a kid you know he was a little kid and he'd been passed from home to home to home um and he wanted to be loved and looked after and it was really obvious like it was really obvious that's what was going on but um and I just I, I'd always wanted to to sort of honor that <laughs> um by by uh bringing him into, into fiction just because I partly because I wanted to do something from his point of view to sort of really get across that when you get really challenging kids that a lot of the time they aren't you know, they aren't who they seem, they aren't who they're just acting. And um, I just, I wanted to, I wanted to put him into a story. So he was, so this is the character Luke, who's um, one of the main characters of A Ruined Girl. Um, he was really probably what, what started that story for me and everything else kind of built around it. Did that make it easier or harder to write then? The fact that this, you know, there was a kind of a real person behind this and that you obviously felt the kind of, I suppose, a sense of responsibility for. But then, yeah. as a writer, particularly as a kind of a writer of crime, something that is essentially a piece of entertainment, mm. 
you almost have conflicting what well, potentially you have sort of conflicting uh pulls upon you then yeah i mean so i didn't know him well you know he was he's a cipher essentially you know and and, and actually all i because you know i say he wanted to be loved like he never told me that <laughs> you know I, he's just he is you know he's a he's an archetype essentially you know he's a he's he's a teenage boy who doesn't want to seem vulnerable and um so really I've, ju I've just used that shell of him so I don't feel responsible to him personally but I think I have sort of felt like I wanted to write something that um that reflects serious issues in society right it doesn't necessarily mean that you you end up being like a bestseller <laughs> Um, because people want escape a little bit more and I try very much not to be didactic and you know it's not like full of statistics about homelessness or anything like that do you know what I mean but um you are at all yeah. I mean I've read it very recently and I think it I think it's actually it's remarkable how you 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 know you've brought those two things together there obviously is a real foundation of reality underneath yeah. it but it doesn't it doesn't slow it down it doesn't sort of encroach it doesn't like you say it doesn't sort of insert itself as a sort of polemic in the book at all yeah I mean that's what I was trying to do because at the end of the day you know we work in the entertainment industry as you're saying you know it does it does kind of need to be fun so um you write with such empathy though Kate that I think mm -hmm. it's so easy to kind of follow the story and also feel the characters you write beautifully thank you I, I think what, what I have to sort of rein in is um wanting to spend too much time like my editors are both said, different editors have both said this like we don't need to know like every thought you know every feeling you can just like you can refer to them but don't like it's not all thoughts and feelings I'm like okay make stuff happen <laughs> yeah very cool very cool and um Rachel so here is your I, when I hold your book up because I've got I was saying this before I've got like the proof version mm -hmm. of your book which means the name is on the back and so it's I, like the yeah. manga version well, that, was the, um, that was the hardback cover that went on the proof and then this is the paperback cover which, which is, is just came out a couple of weeks ago actually it was a bit delayed during lockdown so yeah and this is your second novel yeah in St Albans featuring your Dutch investigator mm -hmm. Martin Janssen who I was very intrigued by him because he is Dutch so he's a member of the the British police but he is uh Dutch so I was curious about you know where did he come from why did you kind of settle on him being uh, a Dutch guy and what does that kind of um foreignness I suppose bring to the book bring to the story so my first novel, Under the Ice, um, I wrote pretty much like Kate. I kind of felt like I had something I really wanted to write about. I wrote about a mother who had a baby and basically her world kind of turned on its head. Um, and I began with the story of the mother. So I kind of had the, the, there was a body found in the lake um, and she was kind of spending her days looking after her baby. Her relationship with her husband is tense. It's breaking down because as we all know, when you have babies, the smaller they are, the more amount of work they are. So she's kind of busy. Um, she's feeling claustrophobic. She's feeling hemmed in. And I found that her story was kind of very claustrophobic and it was becoming kind of, very inward looking and I was enjoying writing it but I needed something to kind of move her away from this kind of cerebral kind of kind of discussion and this kind of as Kate was saying was all about the feelings and what she was feeling and what she was experiencing and it was kind of very almost fragmented at times because she didn't really understand her own emotions and her own thoughts um so along came Martin Janssen to save the day because my father-in-law is Dutch and my husband's half Dutch and I know people, you know, it's a bit stereotypical to say, but the Dutch can be very forthright. They can be very sensible, kind of very blunt, very to the point. And when Martin Janssen came on the scene, he he kind of set, he offset Jenny and her kind of murky kind of wanderings and her mind spinning all over the place. And she couldn't understand what was going on. And, and she was worried she was being haunted and she couldn't kind of grasp reality at times. Um, and he also works quite well, I feel, because St Albans um, is quite a kind of, you know, it's quite well to do outside of London, kind of very relatively middle class, got this kind of nice cathedral, this beautiful big park. Um, and the middle class are very polite. Uh, we have a set of manners, we have a set of rules. And when he comes into that, his kind of straight talking, no messing around with kind of worrying about polite manners 
again, works to offset that quite well. And I think there are so many brilliant crime novels that I read where the detective has some kind of incredible quirk. I don't know, they're missing half a leg or they've got um, a trauma or they're an alcoholic or their marriage is breaking down or there's something kind of really kind of far out um, that kind of challenges them. And I liked Martin Janssen when he arrived in my novel, kind of pretty much fully formed because he is married, he has two children. His kind of unique quality is his, the fact that he doesn't slightly fit with this middle class the polite society without being kind of a tortured soul. Um, so quite, I quite like the way he's, he jarred things and he kind of revealed a certain kind of darkness below the middle class kind of exterior without necessarily kind of, you know, struggling and popping pills or kind of being awake half the night and cheating on his wife. It was quite nice to like him and to feel that he was a relatively straightforward Dutch person. Yeah. yeah, I have a couple of very close Dutch friends actually, and they they it's in, that's interesting what you say about class because they are quite insistent that they don't really have a class structure yeah. in Holland, mm -hmm. and I find it almost hard to unpick that then from my head. I, I kind of you know when my friend said this, I was a bit my first thought was like, well, then what do you have instead? <laughs> because I can't imagine a society without it where people right. aren't kind of measured yeah. up like that. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of well, what is there then? It's I sort of I literally can't get my head around it which just goes to show how ingrained it is yeah mm. yeah and there's so that so that then in some Albans because in your first novel it I was again I was quite intrigued because it takes place in the kind of the run-up to Christmas yeah it's 12 days leading up so it's not the 12 days of Christmas because you know it's the wrong time but it is 12 days leading up yeah, yeah. but that seems to me like quite an interesting idea to put such a dark story into that kind of you know um time of uh, where we're all jolly and bright or whatever it is um why did you why did you decide to do that i think partly because the weather so um i had the the snow comes down in the novel and the trains go down and st Albans is a small city so when the trains go down and the roads are shut down that it's it's quite a kind of claustrophobic feel if you can't kind of go for, particularly with the buggy you can't push the buggy very far in the snow so Jenny has this baby and she just she really she can only really walk a kind of a couple of miles um, and her husband's working from home because the trains are down. And so the snow really um, created that feeling of claustrophobia that I was trying to establish with Jenny. So she's kind of locked in this house with the newborn baby and she feels kind of you know, that she's as many women do I think when they first have a baby they suddenly kind of feel that their life isn't their own anymore and mm -hmm. coming to terms with your relationship with being a mother is is a tricky thing I think um and so the claustrophobia really helps so the snow locking everything down and also I think because I have this body that's found in this icy lake um and with the cathedral in the background she goes to kind of midnight mass and I think Christmas is a funny time isn't it because it is cold and you all get together and you look forward to seeing your family, but people often feel very exasperated. There's a lot of work that women have to do. There's the presents, there's kind of the meals. So there's an awful lot. I think that the flip side of the joy and the lovely kind of collective um, family spirit on Christmas day is often offset with an, a lot of work and kind it's of- It's statistic where there's like more murders over Christmas than any other time of year. I might be completely making that statistic. And death and suicide. Yeah. 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 And I definitely remember years ago, it must have been when I was working as a, a journalist and uh, talking to a funeral director who said that mm. loads of people die on Boxing Day mm. because they kind of, they basically sort of hang on for Christmas. Right. Sort of through Christmas. Like, oh, oh, really? Die like, naturally. Um, and they sort of then kind of expire kind of just afterwards. It's like, right. I distinctly remember, I must have interviewed somebody, them saying that, you know, it's like their busiest time of year or something like this. Mm, right. Right. Um, because yeah, because I suppose it just, all of that pent up expectation kind of focuses around, focuses around Christmas. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Cause it's, it's such a, especially with, with, um, with yours, Rachel, with, with Under the Ice, it's, it's it's not just the cold it's kind of like it sort of adds to that sort of weird like ethereal feel that you get in that time because it's like it's outside of normal time right people aren't at work people aren't doing their normal responsibilities and stuff and so like time kind of blends in and because of all the snow and the cold it sort of feels like 
the landscape's been sort of affected and it's just yeah it's like it, it all blends so well in that well, that's what motherhood is kind of like at the beginning yes. yeah, yeah. Baby, because everything so my my very first novel is kind of is about a mum and her kids who are stuck in the sort of the aftermath of this pandemic basically. Like, well, pandemic yeah yeah the, the pandemic my 2017 pandemic which turned out <laughs> slightly different from the 2020 pandemic um and I think the original the original idea from that for that book came because I read I read somewhere in a blog post somebody described having the first baby as my own personal apocalypse mm. and what they meant by that was that everything about their normal life just stopped overnight mm -hmm. so yeah. you know what they stopped working their social life more or less stopped their body changed their even day and night changed yeah. like suddenly you don't you're not even kind of keeping regular hours like you, your world has become yeah. and mm. it's only actually for a very short amount of time when you look mm. back on it but at mm. the time it feels like you know it, mm. but then it never really real rebuilds back to what it was anyway no. it? you know yeah it's, it's always it's forever changed once that yeah. happens yeah so I think the idea of sort of taking your character and sort of putting them in this kind of slightly other world because I think for a new mum that's that's kind of what life is like really mm. it's all suddenly it's all got a bit sort of surreal um and unpredictable isn't it it's, yeah I yeah. think for me as well just kind of just to go back to the scorched earth when I'd done the Christmas novel when the second one came around I I needed something that was very different to the you know the freezing cold of the kind of snowy Christmas which is why I ended up with the heat wave in the summer because I think kind of as a writer I'm so nervous about rewriting something yeah. I wanted to make it very very new so I ended up kind of switching from you know you had the snowy Christmas to a huge heat wave in the summer which helped again kind of re-establish a new um, background for the novel because I think it is tricky isn't it as writers to to tr some, you know, you like your characters, and you're very nervous. So I am anyway about repeating yeah. elements of them, or or kind of running with the same idea. So it's it's quite nice to be able to change your weather and to change a landscape. Yeah, and then, well, it changes your vocabulary, doesn't it? That you're having to rely on, and your whole sort of bank of yeah metaphors and all all that kind of decorative stuff that you're putting mm. in there, you know, in the book. Yeah. I think you do have to sort of force yourself out of out of your comfort zone as well. you know yeah you, you definitely I think it's very very easy especially if you've got a series actually I haven't got a series but I imagine like if you've got a series and you've got you know you're continuing characters it must be really quite hard to sort of like really force you know things to be different and the tone to be different and stuff but yeah so where do you go next with that Rachel so you, you obviously under the ice was that on winter so, um, yeah birth was very much the not just the summer but like the hottest summer on history that sort of thing yeah so where with can you say I mean with three and four no no I can so um it was supposed to be out in November actually into the fire but given our current global pandemic um everything's been pushed back a bit and uh, similar to you Joe, having read um your latest one which is brilliant um I have a house um where there is a Halloween party happening mm. Um, and it's called Into the Fire. Um, so there's, there are kind of obviously scorch kind of heat elements to it, but it's very much a Halloween novel. It's set over the weekend where a group of um, people get together to sign a contract um, around a big VR investment. Um, and the kind of the signing is to take place on the Saturday and everyone arrives at the house on the Friday. And, you know, not to kind of shock anyone, but there's a murder. Um, and <laughs> oh, no out of the blue blindsided and then by sunday night it's all resolved so i i set it over a weekend um again because scorched earth kind of happens over a period of few weeks into the ice was 12 days so i wanted to um uh, sorry under the ice so i wanted to kind of it to feel different so it's a weekend halloween house party with pumpkins um so yeah i've tried to kind of set it at a different time of year and the time frame because I'm, I'm I'm slightly obsessed with time frames. I I find that the ticking clock in a novel yeah. is really helpful. So I like to really understand when I begin where it finishes, so I can kind of feel like with the characters that you know where the tension's kind of building. Yeah, yeah. In my second novel, I took the the ticking clock idea to quite an extreme, and I had a literal like countdown clock. It was actually in the form of a blog. So there were these every day. There was a blog that was kind of revealing something really crucial and they were counting kind of down and this seemed like such a great idea until I started editing the thing 
And then, of course, anything you change, anything you oh, move. Oh, no. yeah. Oh, I mean, honestly, I think all editors at my publisher now hate me. <laughs> we had so many different Excel spreadsheets trying to work out just the timeline of this. And then right. some people have, because we'd moved stuff around or we'd taken things out, we'd have a day where there was no, we're like, oh my God, it's Tuesday, there's no blog post. So we had to kind of, you know, oh, it was just a nightmare. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I I hear what you say about the, uh, the ticking clock. I'm terrified of them, terrified of them now. You just mentioned about like where your book starts and that was the question I was going to ask you. Like, mm. What's the kind of the very, for you, is it the, that very first germ of an idea? Is it like, a, is it a character? Is it a place? I've come to realise for me, it's actually, it seems to be the ending. I seem to almost mm. see an ending first and mm. then I work out sort of why and how we get there. But I wonder what, uh, Rachel, what, what it is for you. So for me, I have, I start with one idea. So with Jenny in the first one, she was kind of lost in a field with a buggy and she couldn't go anywhere and she was feeling, feeling claustrophobic. With the second one, with Scorched Earth, um, I, I started with a, a suicide, a death by suicide, um, because I, I had a friend who, um, who, who killed herself. And I, in it, much like Kate, I, it's not her story. But I kind of felt that I wanted to to commit something to paper in some way, um, and so I began with that, and I built the story around that with Scorched Earth, and then with Into the Fire, um, I have there's a there's a helicopter crash, and it's it's not too much of a secret um, as I begin in the prologue with the idea of the helicopter crash, but I, I kind of wanted Halloween to be burning. I wanted it to be kind of it's the you know the kind of the fire and the costumes and all the kind of plastic and the the kind of I think Halloween can be quite terrifying beyond the ghosts as well you know for me as a mother walking around with the children in their kind of terrible costumes that I bought for seven pounds from Sainsbury's near all the lit candles I find it quite tense um and I wanted to kind of exacerbate that so I wanted kind of that feeling of the tension of Halloween with the kind of where the flames could go so yeah. I begin I began with a with a with a big helicopter crash and it crashes kind of into the grounds of the house and something has occurred to um to bring the helicopter down and that was there's one image sorry joe yeah no no i was just going to say just picking up on your thing about halloween i think what's quite strange for well for me i suppose is that i, I didn't really grow up with halloween mm. and it's quite strange i think to sort of i find it slightly like you say there's something slightly strange about seeing the kids like they're really they're so into it and they they really feel it and I don't, and it, there's there's a kind of a disconnect there that I kind of think is, I don't know, I find that kind of quite weird that it's almost like these new kind of rituals are coming in. Because I, I don't feel it's, like it's 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 taken on a different hue mm -hmm. in the last sort of, I, well, since I was a kid anyway, yeah, definitely. Definitely, yeah. almost like skipped a generation and now for yeah. kids of like a school age, it's a really mm -hmm. big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, I, mean, I remember Guy Fawkes Night was always like, was really exciting. Yeah. Like, and I literally, I don't think I'd even heard of Halloween. It was, mm. you know, suddenly for it to be such a big part of their kind of, you know, their 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 sort of festival season. Mm. It's um, it I don't know. It's quite strange. Kate Heather has asked us a question that maybe um, I will pop your way. How much planning do you do before writing? Are you a planner? Well, either too much or none. <laughs> um, I do, I um with um with both of my published books horrible amounts of planning like horrible way too much um you know I had a spreadsheet um I would oh I had to I had to know exactly where everything was going um with lock me in I think I'd written about half of it got a bit stuck knew where it was going but got a bit stuck and so I wrote the end like we were just talking about endings like I wrote the end scene well the very much nearly the end scene um and that that made a huge amount of difference um being able to sort of plow on to the end knowing like you were saying about trajectory and really kind of like having a, having a sense of where we were where we were ending up um mm. but yes I think I slowed myself down a lot by planning too much and over researching and I think that's because because I used to be a, a you know a tv well was a researcher and a you know and a journalist lots of sort of things molded into one um but a lot of the programs that I worked on, there were like allegations about people, right? So you had to really stand this up. It's kind of, you know, like you had to have like that legal backing, and make sure that you weren't, you know, making allegations that you get sued, like that would be cool. And so, you know, so everything, every every program that I worked on, 
I would have to sort of, you know, have a list of all of the allegations and a list of all of the evidence of the various different things I'd done. And I had to be so clear with research, like I had to know exactly what I was saying and be able to stand up every single thing. And I think I even moved into fiction and I was like, oh, I have to do the same thing. I don't think you really do. You can make it up a little bit more. And, um, um, you know, I I should probably do that a little bit more and, you know, and allow myself that kind of, um, yeah. you know, that breadth and stuff. But um, yeah, for the next book, I'm definitely going to do less. Um, do you think that comes think from, the, from the fact that I was thinking about this the other day that it, it's I mean, it's quite a weird thing to do, isn't it? Fiction like you just mentioned there, Kate, like, you know, you have to almost let yourself make it up. And we are kind of like mm. we're both well, formerly we were both journalists and Rachel, you were a, a teacher. Mm. So they're quite, you know, they're quite sort of practical jobs. And I wonder mm. whether there's there's a maybe a slight part of us that feels like what we're doing is a bit like not real, you know, or mm. silly. Frivolous. Almost. Yeah. 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 yes yeah and I think in a way that's probably part of the reason why I felt like with a ruined girl I mean it was it wasn't that I wanted to kind of do something serious and like you know make sure that people came away with like a new perspective on the you know on mm -hmm. care or whatever um but I think I, I have sort of in the past kind of felt like I really need to do something that 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 means something you know yeah. that you can like you know but um, but I think yeah with the next book it's it's all about it's all about fun <laughs> um yeah and and what I'm, I'm struggling what I'm struggling with with the next book actually is I've got this character who's really not very likable and um and there's this this part of me that just sort of feels like I really have to make my characters kind of likable you have to sort of and you know you obviously you do have to care about their journey but you don't have to think they're nice right and I've only sort of given myself permission to do this recently and I'm just like you don't it's fine it's fine like I get to the end of the chapter and I'm like oh she's awful and I was like mm, I think that's okay you know it's oh. it's tricky isn't it to kind of strike that, that balance that's like, between... my, that's like my USP I think is unlikable characters and I and <laughs> I've sort of I don't know I mean so again the first one that I wrote all the little children I can't, it was part of my sort of like you know the big idea that you have for the novel was that so I started writing it when my kids were, were really little and I was quite shocked around that time at sort of how much negative commentary there was about mothers kind of mm. in the press mm. um, and particularly sort of you know newspapers like the Daily Mail or whatever it seemed to me that there was this kind of damned if you do damned if you don't thing like you know that one week they'd run an article about you know, some woman who had a had a, a big job and she was a mother and how amazing is she? And, you know, she was almost held up as like some sort of heroine, you know, for, for doing these things. And then the very next week, the same kind of person, someone that was working and a mother would be sort of reviled, you know, and you're kind of like, well, you can't win, can you? Basically, whatever you do, you can't mm. win. And they're just, and it, I don't know whether it was just those few years or whether I was particularly sensitive or what it was. But I think there was a time like, very much like they were sort of trying to play each, play us off against each other as well. Like yeah, almost exactly. trying to say, which camp are you in? I'm like, I'm not in a camp. The mummy you know? war. I mean, they literally called it the mummy war, right? Mm. And that was kind of where, and so when I wrote this first novel, the part of my thing was that I just wanted to write the character that the Daily Mail would hate. <laughs> um, you know, she would do everything that they hate and I still to this day and the, and I mean the reviews um you know on the most on the, on the, most of them were positive even a lot of people who said like I just hated her hated her because she wasn't naturally maternal and people can't seem to cope with this no uh, it's just they just you know they just kind of like oh she's yeah. um but yeah, I kind of, I, 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 it did. I did just find it so curious to to sort of look through the book and kind of say, well, what exactly does she do that is so terrible? Because in mm -hmm. the end, she she is abrasive, and she's very sort of she's quite sort of arrogant, I suppose. But she sort of got that justified arrogance because she's actually just so more so much more effective than most of the other people around her that she just kind of gets on and does things. Mm. Um, and basically she spends the whole novel trying to protect three children and a whole bunch of other children. I'm kind of like, what exactly has she done wrong? But I was so, I found it so interesting that when the book went out there, because of course, you know, you've got no idea how it's going to be received, mm. um, you know, to see that there were so many people that just kind of reacted so strongly to her. Mm. Um, and yeah, so that was interesting. So uh, best of luck with your unlikable character. But Thanks. Kerry has said, <laughs> Kerry has commented that uh, some of the best books she's read have had characters she dislikes. So I think yeah. that absolutely, I think there there are loads and loads of readers out there who just want to read a good 
just yeah. an interesting character where you don't have mm. to go to dinner with them do you you just read mm. them. no I think you do have to offset them though yeah. you know you, you do have to have a character that you do even if it's a minor character you know or a child or something you know you do have to have a character that you sort of go you look forward to seeing them you know um yeah. But yeah, I, I read, I mean, it's not crime, but I read um, My Year of Rest and Relaxation um, recently. I don't know if you've read that. My character in there, she's just horrible. She's absolutely loathsome. Um, and I could not get enough of it. I just, honestly, I just absolutely adored it. Um, but I think, I think there's an, you know, I think people are getting more used to there being unlikable women in fiction, actually. You know, I think it's 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 definitely becoming something that that people are kind of like more, more accepting of. But um yeah, it's just that sort of honesty that, that absolutely happens. the honesty. Yeah. Wait, do you think female characters get like a harder time than male characters? Like you you mentioned earlier about your detectives and how you know this. We, and we are used to that kind of that that detective who is you know he maybe he's he's an alcoholic or he he's he's you know he's estranged from his family or he's just got some kind of peculiar habits. And we seem to kind of forgive those characters. And I sort of I've always felt that if you transposed a woman into that position I don't think she'd get such an easy time yeah I think it's I think women have a terrible time obviously in in novels um I was right writing today I've about this woman and she's in a station and she's being interviewed and I have her kind of think to herself must remember to smile I've got to remember to smile and then I've got the detective having his reaction watching her and he's thinking about his daughters and he kind of like I, I try to make him very right on because I like him a lot and I want him to kind of be on our side and he kind of thinks to himself in the novel he thinks oh women are always doing this women always feel that they have to be likable in order to be believed whereas men feel they need to be strong so mm -hmm. he kind of says what she's trying to do and she kind of thinks that kind of you know thinks the action because mm -hmm. I think it's so true that women feel that to be believed or to be liked or to be respected that there's a certain degree of being liked whereas I think with men it's, it's that whole thing about jobs isn't it women apply for jobs that they feel they can do and men apply for jobs that that they're ready to take the challenge on for mm -hmm. and so women justify it all first but they wouldn't kind of well they don't often kind of necessarily leap in with the sense of confidence I think that's kind of society bred a bit and that's what you know isn't it nice to be able to take that on yeah absolutely yeah women mirror a lot don't they they sort of mirror other people's behavior we should talk a little bit about so this was um afraid of the light this was a collection oh look we've all got one um, this was <laughs> Got the right of nails at least well done yeah right <laughs> the next level that is um we all contributed a story to this which came out in when did it come out like march during yeah during the lockdown wasn't yeah. it during lockdown for sure mm. uh crime short stories and um happily we're doing another one which is going to come out hopefully sometime before uh christmas christmas time. Um, so we should definitely kind of give this a little mention where are you with your stories i've read your story kate which was fantastic i had um, so much fun with that <laughs> i really enjoyed writing that story i haven't written a short story like before i did my one for afraid of the light i hadn't written a short story for years um mm -hmm. and then i i've been really looking forward to writing my one for the second anthology and i i got, I got a lot out of that it was yeah. it was really good fun yeah <laughs> It's funny when because I, I didn't really for the first anthology I had a story that I had sort of written in the past and then I just sort of never finished it really um oh yeah Kerry's happy about the new anthology um and I, I hadn't sort of finished it I hadn't polished it and I kind of revisited it and this was the first time that I just kind of wrote something completely I was like oh my goodness you know this deadline's coming up I've got to write a story um and it's really curious how I think what's really nice about short stories is that you can explore quite a small idea yeah. and kind of see where it, you know, just kind of stretch and it. Does have basically with one idea, doesn't it? Like you can't yeah. sort of go off into backstory, well, a bit of backstory, but like, yeah, mm. yeah. But then you've still got to, Rachel, you've still got to sort of create the whole kind of world of it and the characters and all the rest of it. And that almost takes as much work as a novel. Yeah, and also your um, your kind of word, you know, your word deprived almost. So with Kate, you were saying earlier that you know you have a tendency to delve into kind of almost too many thoughts, too many feelings, and you, you mm. edit that out. Whereas 
with less than 3,000 words, I found it really tricky because I'm used to, I mean, we've talked about the weather, but I love bringing in kind of outside, you know, the character's kind of thoughts in order to set the tone. So that whole pathetic fallacy of, you know, the, the landscape mirroring the tone. Yeah. With, if you've got less than 3,000 words, that can be quite a challenge. Yeah, yeah. it's all gone. Yeah. It's all good. Yeah. yeah, I really enjoyed the discipline of it because I am a bit of a wiffly waffler when it comes to writing. So it was quite nice just to have to kind of, you know, squeeze it all down and just take out any any fat, you know, take any yeah, fat. Yeah, that's it. You, you have to strip out like everything that's even remotely superfluous. Like, you know, yeah. does, does this line advance the, the single storyline that I need to tell here? And if it doesn't, it's just got to go. And I love yeah. that. I, I really do. It's, it's a lot yeah. of fun. Yeah, it's a brilliant discipline, isn't it? Um, mm. Christopher, hello, Christopher McDonald. He is also looking forward to the next anthology, which is um, fantastic. Um, we are, we've been talking for 50 minutes, which is remarkable. I feel like we've only been on, um, on for five minutes. So um, as we, uh, if, if there's any questions from anyone watching, if there's any last minute questions, now is your moment, because we're only going to be here for another um, couple of five minutes. Um, so just to finish up, well, we've talked a little bit about what you've got uh, coming next. Rachel, we're coming up. Your third novel will be coming out. So when, when will your third novel in this series be coming out? Because yours, is, like you said before, it's been affected by the COVID and it's been pushed back. So it's going to be next year? Yes, yeah, so the third one's out now in April in hardback, paperback out kind of at, at the end of the summer. And then the fourth one is currently still on schedule for November next year. So yeah, I've got two hardbacks out next year and, and one paperback, which feels very strange, but mm. exciting. Yeah. And um, what about you, Kate? What's next? Uh, summer, I think. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I know I need to. I, I'm the, the book needs to be delivered by next summer, but I'm not entirely sure when it's out. I think it, I think it's probably the end of the summer as well. Um, okay. I should know that, but I don't. <laughs> well, one of the things that I wanted to uh, to ask you about. So, Kate, I wanted to ask you about the Bath novel because your so yeah. a Ruined Girl under a different title was the winner yes. of the Bath Novel Award, which is amazing. Yes. It was um, amazing. <laughs> and, and it's weird because I, when I used to live in Singapore, I actually knew somebody who was one of the previous uh, winners. Oh, really? Who was that? Clarissa Gawanawan. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, and because um, we were in the same writers group, so we were right. kind of workshopping our books at the at the same time. Um, and then you know she won the Bath Novel Award and, and I didn't, um, so you know <laughs> fine. <laughs> I, 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 I hardly noticed. Um, <laughs> but I was really curious that obviously you you as a pre prior winner, you've now been sort of judging it. So I wondered what that yeah. process was like oh man it was lovely I absolutely loved it so so um you know having gone through the sort of process of seeing the long list you know my name coming up the long list of being like, oh, and then seeing the short list and I was just I I, I mean I probably everyone says this I genuinely couldn't believe it I was so so excited about that but um yeah being sent the so I get sent the how many did they I think I got 30 um 5,000 words seg wow. like you know the openings to these novels the the standard was I mean, extraordinary. It was, I, I, I've, I've was really humbled by it actually. Like it's possible that they'd been given a, a, a once over by the, some of the main organizers before they were sent out for judging by all the independent judges. But um, yeah, I, I, you know, I was supposed to basically just say yes or no to the question, do you want to read more of this manuscript? Okay. And I knew that I couldn't say yes to all of them. I basically wanted to say yes to all of them. You know, it was really hard to say no to, you know, a, a decent chunk. But um, yeah, no, they were they were amazing. And and the, I read all of the ones that were on the shortlist and they were just so, so good. Um, there's one um, I love the, the winner. The Arrow Garden was um, wonderful. I didn't read the whole thing. I read. Oh, did I? No, I didn't. Um, I read the extract from that one, but one of the runners up in the shortlist was um possibly the best book I've read this year, um, as well. And I'm really hoping that um that, that gets um snapped up. It was and that was just the runner up. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Um, yeah, they, they were they were great. I loved it. I loved it. I I would do that for a living in a shot if I could do that. It was great. <laughs> was interaction with the other judges, or is it all just like you just kind of no, absolutely in a vacuum. Yeah, yeah, didn't have any interaction with them at all. You don't get together and sort of discuss it like a committee kind of that. No, I mean, no, I mean, I had to. So for the for the shortlisting stage, when I was sent the whole, the full manuscripts, I think I had 
four full manuscripts to read. Um, and I did a sort of, you know, like a, a couple of pages about, you know, my, my feedback for those, um, which was just basically done as a text document and then and then sent on. Um, but no, there was no there was no interaction or and, and sadly, obviously, this year, there was no like award ceremony or anything like that, yeah. which there was, you know, there always usually is. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, it was a blast. I loved it. And my daughter's actually going to be um, one of the readers for the for the oh. children's the children's one as well. I was like, can my oh, daughter read? And Caroline, yeah, of course. Oh, so that, that's, that's, so that's so nice. That must have been such a game changer for you. you yeah, it, it really, really was. I mean, um, so the Knox, um, a ruined girl, used to be called the Knox. Yeah. Um, it was already out on submission, and um, you know, yeah, it, it it definitely felt like it sort of suddenly became. Mm. much more of a like a proper prospect um yeah. and yeah I was I was really proud of that <laughs> um yeah still because I mean you know as someone that's been there in that that stage of like the aspiring novel novelist you know the Bath Novel Award is the big one that you're kind of aiming towards I mean I don't yeah. know this is the thing though, because I, I didn't really I've never really entered a great deal of stuff before actually no I, I entered the CWA um, the debut dagger um, a few years ago as well, and but, but with the rest of like novel awards, so I, I hadn't really entered very many. I felt really bad because like last year when I went, like people had come from all over the country, and there were people on the long list who were like from all around the world. I live five miles from Bath. Like, <laughs> I just I just rocked up, you know, <laughs> like yeah, babysitter. It's like five minutes down the road. Um, but yeah, no, it was. Um, I think I realised how big it was, like as the process went on, because at mm -hmm. the beginning I just, you know, thought it was local, you know, because it was to me. Right, yeah. <laughs> no, it's, very, I mean, it's incredibly international, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and what about you, Rachel? What's your sort of? What was the kind of the moment that you realised that this, you know, this kind of dream that we all have of being a writer, that it was actually going to stick? So I, I started the the first novel um, when I had. Um, when I was on maternity leave with my first child and no one was sleeping. And it was a way of kind of a little bit escaping that. It was giving me some some headspace when I couldn't actually go anywhere. Um, so I used to kind of write in 10 minute, 20 minute, half an hour snatches um, wow. when the baby slept. It was honestly, it was like a lifeline. Um, and I never thought it was going anywhere. I didn't take it seriously at all. And then a couple of years later, when I kind of had about 40,000 words, um, I joined um, one of the Curtis Brown creative courses. So I was really lucky to get on. You kind of enter, you kind of send an application off with a, a novel in progress. And I got a place and it was amazing. So there was me, there was 15 of us on this course and we would have kind of sessions every week. And then we would also have amazing novelists or kind of agents or um kind of editors like loads of people from around the industry to come and to speak to us 15 of us in a room so we had David Mitchell for for wow. two hours and he gave us this amazing kind of talk but then he went round and he asked us to kind of pitch the novels to him and then he kind of gave us all feedback it was incredible um and that suddenly made me think that this novel might be real I couldn't pretend anymore that it was yeah. kind of private scribblings because I was reading sections out and I was discussing it. I had to, I had to take it seriously. Yeah. And at the very end, you have this kind of cocktail party where you resubmit your first 3,000 words. And in theory, they're obviously a better quality than they were when you began the course. Um, and you send in your pitch letter, your query letter, which um, is the letter you send to try and get an agent. And then the Curtis Brown agents um, are in the room and they, they've read your work. So I had some amazing kind of, you know, stellar agents talking to me and saying that they'd be interested in reading the novel when I finished it and could I please send it to them. Mm -hmm. So I kind of walked away from that night feeling that, you know, this was something real and, mm -hmm. and I kind of went away. And instead of kind of doing half an hour every couple of weeks, I, I made time and I sat down and I finished it and I polished it and I took it seriously. And I had I had an agent kind of within the year. So right. that was I think doing a course, I you know, I would say to anyone, it's really worthwhile because it's not so much that they can teach you to write, but they teach you to take your work seriously. And they no, and I think being aware true. of your own work and being able to edit yourself and just looking at it critically, those yeah. skills or or that belief in your work is tricky. I think it's tricky to to get on your own when you're just mm -hmm. kind of privately writing with a closed mm -hmm. door. So that's yeah. really helpful. 
We've got one minute left. In fact, we no longer have one minute left because it's eight o'clock, but I'm going to give us one minute anyway. So that kind of, Rachel, kind of connects me quite nicely with what I was going to ask you, like really briefly, what are your sort of top writing tips? We've all done courses. We're all kind of, you know, course -y kind of people. Um, so, you know, as Rachel says, like, take it seriously, approach it as a bit of a discipline. Um, what would you say, Kate? Because I know you've done a master's as well. Yeah, I've done two. <laughs> <laughs> I love them. They're obviously, yeah, that's totally my thing. Um, I would say, yes, definitely do a course. It doesn't have to be a master's. Um, you know, there, there are plenty of um, shorter online courses. I would say it's really important to share your work with people. Like you're saying, Rachel, take it, you know, to make it so that you're taking it seriously, to take it to that next, next level. Show your work to people who you don't know um and who aren't going to tell you it's kind of like everyone's mum tells them they're really good at singing you know you don't need to hear that you need to be told what isn't working and you need to be yeah. open to that and you need to really really listen but don't listen to everyone so listen but don't listen <laughs> <laughs> yeah only listen to people that you really respect I remember reading this I mean absolutely be completely open to all the you know open to all the criticism but I remember being told there's like three things you can do with the criticism which is something like adapt adopt and ignore and ignore exactly <laughs> <laughs> so I, so I was really i was going to run out of steam then um you know so obviously a, a, a adopt is like you kind of go yeah you're absolutely right i'm going to do what you say ignore is like no but the most useful one i think is always adapt which mm -hmm. is kind of like, okay there's really an issue mm -hmm. here what am i going to do about it you know mm -hmm. and, and be sort of open to that that kind of feedback yeah it's important not to do a course just to be told you're good because if yeah. you're going to a course where you're just told you're good, then it's not a good course. Yeah, yeah you know? exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, ladies, thank you so much. That's great. Thank you. Uh, I feel like I've seen my wine glass going up a lot more than I saw. No, you've, your... no, you've seen mine. Mine's, Mine's entirely gone. Glass. I'm ready for it <laughs> <that> now. <laughs> just been more surreptitious about it. Okay. Well done. Um, thank you both so much, and uh, farewell. And. Have a good evening and thank you to everyone who dropped in and asked us questions. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for having me today.